Welcome to the Shema Podcast, the podcast for the perplexed, where Torah insights intertwine through personal stories as well as interviews with leading Torah scholars demonstrate the empowering qualities of Torah and mitzvot. For more great Torah learning through Torch, the Torah Outreach Center of Houston, go to torchweb.org. Now to the show. to the Shema podcast. I have a very special episode for all of you today. And I want to begin with why I have this amazing guest on with us. Many of you know, I started this podcast this year because as I was beginning this journey that started many years ago to learn Torah and to live Torah, I had the remarkable opportunity several years in of meeting these amazing rabbis from Torch and learning from them. And I wanted to share them with you answer my questions with you listening, share all my struggles as well so we can learn together and grow. And the guest that I am so grateful for that we have on is someone that I have found for years now to be a source of inspiration. But I want to back up a little bit. I used to listen to music as I became started becoming religious simply when I was working out in the morning. And what I realized one day was I was listening to a song and I heard some lyrics that I found very questionable. And I went back and looked at the lyrics on the iPhone and realized this was the biggest heresy. It was a total desecration of Hashem. I freaked out. I pulled the headphones out of my ear and I swore music off. I was like, I I don't want to listen to music anymore. I don't trust what's going to be entering into my ears, entering into my gates. But a problem sort of just surfaced after a while. And that was... As I was working out, I was listening to podcasts, Jewish podcasts, like Rabbi Wolby's Parsha podcast and Jewish history and Rabbi Ari Wolby's Musar podcast. Now my soul is delighted. My body is furious with me because it's telling me, hey, Dan, you're waking me up at 5 a.m. And I need something more to get myself going. And I began this quest to find some kosher music. And I came across a video of a man named Nassim Black. I remembered this individual. I remember reading about him around 10 years ago, right when I learned the truth about Torah and began my studies of how he converted to Judaism, going from a lifestyle that was totally different from Torah observant Judaism to one that is. I found that to be so inspiring. And I remember learning about how his rabbis wanted him to take his music that he was doing before he became a Jew to with him as a Jew. And I was looking at this video and realized like he did it. This is amazing, and I downloaded all his music on my, my playlist, and that's what I've been listening to every morning. And it was like now I gave something to that my soul wanted, my body wanted. It was like a peace treaty that I had something that would make them both rejoice. And I wanted to bring this gentleman on. I thought, you know, he's too busy. There's no way I could get him to come on the show. But as I was sitting down writing an email To the management team at his website, I was listening to Think Torah podcast with Aaron Wolgenlinter, and he was interviewing Eli Goldsmith, who announces that he is the booking manager for Nassim. And so here we are. Nassim, welcome to the Shema podcast. I'm so delighted that you're here. Thank you so much. I really appreciate the introduction. That was uh, beautiful. 
Thank God, I got to learn something new also. <laughs> I'm, I'm telling you, 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 seriously, I had this big internal battle and you, your music alleviated it. And now my soul and my body are happy because of it. Amazing. I want to start with something because, you know, I've been through this process where I was a secular Jew, total atheist, age of 40, going through this process, learning Torah. We just moved to a community four months ago. And now my wife and daughter are going through a conversion. Wow. And you've been through this conversion process. And I wanted to learn a little more about your spiritual fathers and how they guided you and brought you through that process. That's a very, very beautiful way to to put it. To be honest, it was very, very hard in the beginning. We had no spiritual fathers except for the father himself. (laughs) You know, we had started our journey you know, after being a very dark place, obviously, you know, my relationship with hip hop was one of, you know, more gangster music and, and which which sort of led to a certain lifestyle. You know, after being in such a dark place and really sort of hitting a place of rock bottom, you know, I started to search and and I had already been very familiar with Christianity and Islam and different things like that. But I wanted to know more about Judaism because I grew up in a Jew- Jewish neighborhood. I knew that uh, Judaism was a foundation for the, the Bible itself, for the Christian Bible. So, you know, I started to dig a little deeper. And the more and more that I dug... I started to feel a little bit more connected, connected to the story, seeing the beautiful story between Hashem, uh, God, and the Jewish people, and seeing that relationship of them constantly falling and never able to rise to what they were supposed to be and falling again and falling again, and God saying that no matter what, I'm going to take you back. It didn't come without some rebuke, but it definitely was a, a, everything uh, depends on it. You know, when we look towards the future and what the future redemption is going to be like, there's many promises, that's, that, is, and one of the main promises is a restoration of that relationship on the highest level. So reading this as a non-Jew definitely inspired me so I mean uh, what was guiding me during this time I had nobody to talk to there was no no friend and no rabbi or anything it just really took a lot of prayer and me looking at the story of the Avos looking at Avram Avinu was my inspiration and Yaakov Avinu and, and you know David Amelech you know so that really guided me for a long time and so it took me maybe uh, a couple years or, or two, three years before I was in a proper community and able to have guidance from rabbis. Amazing. That's exactly my story. It was it was I was by myself using books, and internet, and it was uh, of course made a difference when you find some people in your life. Now let me ask you this: right. one of the challenges I had is I had this old persona myself, like in the business world, like everyone knew. You know, I was the guy that they would literally the CEO would bring me out to a conference. To be the guy to take the guys out partying. And it would be on the weekend too. Eventually I had to sit there and say, okay, I'm, I don't travel anymore on Shabbos and here's why. But when, when I would go out, when they would bring me these events, everyone knew this old Dan that I wanted to go away. You know, the Dan that was, would talk inappropriately, make jokes. You know, I was the guy that they expected to take him to a strip joint. And I just wanted to say like, that guy is, is, is dead. And I have to, you know, introduced this new version of myself. And it was like this while, while there I was like struggling right. with that. And I'm sure going from with your career, going from rap with your, the, the lyrics that were probably much different than what your lyrics are now. Talk a little bit about how you made that transition. I think everyone sort of goes through that at some point. No, it's very true. That is a internal battle that is just, it really takes God to be able to overcome it because there's so many things in your mind about other people's perception, you know, you know, how are they going to see me? What are people going to think? That type of thing. I think the the advantage that I had was, was that right before I started my journey, I'd already moved out of my, you know, a neighborhood that I grew up in. Um, I was living alone for the first time. My girlfriend, who actually is my wife now, we've been together, me and my wife, since we were since 17 years old, high school sweethearts. So we have finally, you know, gotten away. And and being away from everybody sort of helped me be able to have a lot of those things just only in my mind without having to interact with people just because I pulled myself out of the environment. But I would definitely say the that struggle is one of the most realest struggles that a person could possibly have. I remember, you know, I was maybe 
I'm going to say this was in 2008 or whatever. I was about 13 or 14 songs, I think, into a project, something like that, into a brand new album. And all of a sudden, I have this transformation, change of heart. I'm starting to learn. I'm praying more. And I wasn't just praying. I was fasting. I was going three days with no food, going out crying, uh, begging God for answers. You know what I'm saying? I'm begging Hashem really for answers. What are the, you know? And I was really devoting myself to this, like, you know, eight hours a day between the learning and going through all the different texts and going out praying and crying and everything else. And what was interesting was, Going, you know, being, you know, that many songs into a project, I went in because I still had concerts, you know, at this time, and I recorded like all brand new songs. I scrapped everything I had before I recorded brand new songs because I was so eager to erase the old me. I was so eager to, you know, um, to not go back out and be known as that person anymore, which I think is a very, very necessary part of growth you know what i mean and, and and then later on we may find that there were beautiful elements or things that we were we were given to be able to enhance our yiddishkeit to enhance others and to inspire them but it's a very necessary point to sort of like sume ra as it says david amelik says sume ra asetov where you're running you're running fleeing from evil um in order to do good and the heart naturally wants to do that once you you've had such an encounter with god and with the truth now was it difficult to transform your music from the rap and the lyrics that you did in your previous life and transforming that to now where your music is all in the honor of Hashem and, and your Judaism? T- talk about that a little bit. So I would say I didn't find it as challenging for two reasons. Uh, reason number one is because, you know, as a person changes, it's much easier to be authentic to yourself. You know, just it's a natural thing. Like, you know, if a person is already accustomed to being themselves. So when I started making records more from a whether, you know, faith standpoint or whatever, I it was just already w- who I was. You know, it was, th- these were the conversations I was having. I was having outside of music, so it was much easier. Same thing with uh, swearing. You know, I haven't said a swear word since two thousand eight, so it was very easy for me to not swear on music because I, I stopped swearing in, in in my daily life. The second reason I would say is because. I think God just gave me a natural gift to be a musical chameleon, you know. Um, I've been asked um, many different times, like, you know, you know, I just made a song with, like, Shlomo Katz. Uh, hopefully that's going to come out soon. I'm working on another one with Zusha. Other, you know, Jewish singers that sound nothing like me, but these are listen, singers I'm listening to. People ask me, well, how do you make that work? Like, I'm a musical chameleon. There's no genre, there's no nothing that I don't feel like I can't get myself into a place to where I can do it. So i sort of been uh, blessed and gifted you know, in that regard. That's amazing. Was the idea of taking your music with you, was that something that was accepted by the the rabbis and the, those in your community? Were some pushing back on that as saying, well, that's because I know one of my friends, Rabbi Cohen, one of my teachers said that it used to be when someone would convert, they would say, leave all the goyish stuff behind. And he right. was sort of telling me like, no, 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 that's because that's the wrong idea. You want to, everyone wants to take what they get in the exile and elevate it and raise the sparks yeah. in it. Right. Well, I, I think, you know, it goes back to one of the, you know, the other question you said before, because with me, honestly, when I actually started my Garris, I gave it up. You know, nobody told me I had to. I just felt inside that, you know, this isn't the direction that I'm going in my life. And, and ultimately, my relationship with music, you know, was uh, probably unhealthy. It was it was not a means to something. It was the means within it of itself. It was, you know, the end all for me. I love music so much. So for me, I remember even at that time, I sort of looked at it as, as a, you know, this is this is my time to to perform an akeda, to to sacrifice my 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 beloved and and only son, and if it's Hashem's will for it to come back, then it will come back. But as of right now, I was willing to throw it all away, and I did, you know, um, and I left it for a few years. And to be honest, it was really great. Right around the end of that time. You know, right before I would come back to music, you know, the messages started coming very strong. I was supposed to, and I had rabbi support. People were telling me within the community. Uh, my wife started to support it, and it was good for me to take that break. Though I thought it was very necessary, and I still thank God today for it. Because had I not 
done it, I don't know if I would have been able to be the strong person that I am right now. I was I was able to have a situation where I was able to change my relationship with music and you, you use it basically as a clea, as a vessel to be able to project what's going on inside, as opposed to it being you know everything in and of itself. So. You know, I didn't really get any pushback. You know, as time has gone on, you know, there's some people in some communities that were outside of the community. I was originally in Seattle that have had some pushback. But the biggest thing is, it's sort of like, you know, well, music is a lot harder anyway, because like which Jewish music doesn't form from Goetia music? Like, you know, uh, if you look at Yuval and, and Bracious, you know, and, the, and Dalit, Dalit, I think it's chapter four of Bracious, verse 21, it talks about Yuval. Yuval is the one who created the first uh, instruments. You know, the harp and, and I think the lyre or whatever. So we understand that music music and musical instruments in itself, it, its origins was in a place of tuma, of emo, evil, right? And it says that it wasn't until Levi was born, right, who would go on to, the, his descendants will go on to be the music, the musical soundtrack, so to speak, in the base of Mikdash, in the, in the temple, that music was finally elevated, right? And then gone on to King David and all the beautiful things that were able to take place. King David actually before the base of Mikdash. But obviously, we see that music, the whole entire Jewish approach to music has always been to take that which is mundane and elevate it to Kedusha, you know? So I think that that is, you know, I'm only acting in the same exact way as that, you know, the Jewish approach has been. Mizrahi music sounds like the Mizrahi countries it comes from. Ashkenazi music sounds like the Ashkenazi music it comes from. And so, so forth, you know, and so forth, so... I just happen to come from, you know, the inner city, so my music sounds like with the inner city music, you know, with a different with a different tune. I love it. Yeah, you're right. I mean, music is part of God's creation for a reason. When I started moving this community and I go to the shul, it's the first time to dive in with the community and, and there's the prayer and song is is such a profound part of what we do on Shabbos. And it seems like that that music is a means of communication that has a profound impact on our emotional state and our, our level of just overall connection with one another. You know, when our words are synced up and there's similar rhythm and music involved, it seems like that's why that there's a, a purpose for that. Can you speak to that at all? Probably much greater insight than me. Absolutely. Absolutely. I would definitely uh, say that there's no doubt about it, that music and one of the biggest things, this is also one of the th- biggest things that inspired me to come back to music was understanding its spiritual power. You know, it's very, very powerful. A lot of the prophets in the Bible were a- only able to reach their level of prophecy through music. Uh, you know, the most prime example, you know, of that is actually in um Malachim and Kings and Kings where it talks about Elisha who had lost because of his aggravation he had lost his his ability to prophesy so he brought in musical instruments and, and uh, instrumentalists to come in and play in order for him to receive his 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 prophecy so which in you know Hasidic thought music is also prophecy so it's a very very holy item and we understand it it can and and with that it can also bring a person to the lowest places. So that's why it's a very, very sensitive item. Right. Anything can be used, any tool can be used to bring people away from Hashem or bring them closer, for right. sure. So I appreciate that insight. Talk about Motherland Bounce. For the Motherland. Yeah. Yeah. We gonna play it loud and the chill it, yeah. Yeah. We gonna blow the roof up off the building, yeah. We gon' play that motherland bounce. Check it out now, motherland bounce. Check it out now, motherland bounce. We bought yeah. black and get a shopping with a Sammy Davis cousin. Tried to dodge the industry, but now my name is buzzing. They all saying that I'm conscious. I say that it's nonsense. So I say I've been on since on. Had an on switch from Seattle, the rainy city where my mom lived. In Jerusalem, the golden city that was conquered. But still we moving onward. Motherland conquest. Smell me like an armpit. Yeah. Yeah, we gon' play it loud until they kill it, yeah. Yeah, we gon' blow the roof up off the building, yeah. Yeah, we gon' play that motherland bounce. Check it out now, motherland bounce. Check it out now, motherland bounce. We yabba. My mama told me that I read good. Been on my straight and narrow, but my history is the hood. Thank God today that we could buy a box of Cheerios or kicks. I can even buy tricks. I'm no longer on wick. EBT car rip in my passport lip. Stamp like a notary from every country that I went. Ain't a country like this from the others you've been sent. Black is beautiful. This gon' be the motherland hit. Yeah. 
What's behind that song? What's the, the messaging there? What drove the inspiration to creating that song? There's so many different things. A Motherland Bounce, it came at a time where I was, there were a few different things. There was this constant battle and struggle that I was having internally and externally. On one level, we were having some trouble getting our kids into school because of the color of our skin. Some of them, I just call it what it is, that there were, you know, some gatekeepers. Generally, I would say overall, my experience um, inside the religious world has been one of love and acceptance and just, you know, beautiful kindness and that I've never even seen before in my life, you know. But there have been some rotten apples, and some of those have been, you know, with, you know, us trying to get the kids into school. So we were facing, for the first time, you know, some adversity in, in terms of, you know, our skin color. Along with that, every time I was going to New York, every time I found myself in New York or somewhere in the United States, I get out of the airport and, you know, there's people there and they start asking me, hold on, how are you Jewish if you're black? And, you know, these other come from African-American community, you know, like asking me very serious questions, intense questions. And, you know, um, and so I sort of wanted to make something that answered everybody's questions. You know, you want to know how serious I am about my Judaism, about my Yiddishkeit? I'll show you. You want to know how serious I am about being happy about my color and who I am and where I come from? I will show you. And I think maybe what topped it off, most people would not like to know the inspiration came from there, but I think one of the biggest inspirations was I went to Rev Chaim Kenievsky, who's one of the leaders of the Jewish people, and his words, what he said to me was that your skin color is not your chesaron, that's not a lacking, that is your mila, that's your virtue. And so I wanted to sort of make something that answered everybody's question. And I wanted to be unapologetic, unapologetic about my Judaism. I wanted to be unapologetic about my skin color. And I wanted to be unapologetic about serving God. So that's why I said, you know, I coined the phrase there that's become sort of my hashtag and my team sort of ran with it was God's man, because that's sort of what I feel like Hashem's ambassador in the world. And yes, I may check off a lot of minority boxes. Right. But that's where we find God at the most with the lowest of the lowest, the people that check all all the boxes of being the lowest of the lowest. I check all those boxes. And what's my strength? My strength is that God is my strength. So that was really my my message behind that song. That's beautiful. It should be 100% of everyone in the Jewish community should be embracing you and not looking at that. But I'm not because it's obviously totally counter to everything that Torah teaches us. Right. Absolutely. Absolute counter. But you know what? We have to accept that in in every place in the world, no matter where we go, that there will always be bad apples. Right. You know, and thank God, fortunately, that I've been able to say not only for myself and other people that I know also color is a minimal experience, you know, um, to the to the, you know, being black and Jewish experience, a very, very minimal experience. And one that I don't think was like so significant. Thank God, my kids and everywhere that they're supposed to be. I sort of look at these things and say it's an Isayon. It's a it's a test and a hurdle of something to overcome. And I think we did very well. My kids are very happy. They have friends. I have kids of every color and every background in my house, you know, every single week for Shabbos. You know, I sort of wish it was a little bit more calm, but uh, it's not. <laughs> and Baruch Hashem, I, and, and we've had a wonderful and amazing experience. So one monkey don't stop the show. That's exactly right. I love the line in the song, Hitler's worst nightmare. <laughs> you know, you know, he's so Aryan, you know, he he, he thought of himself, Yamak Shemul, uh, to be so great and his people, like, you know what I mean? Now, what if the guy was Jewish and he was black? You know, he would never be able to sleep this guy. Right, exactly, which is why I love it. So good for you for, uh, for making that song. Does your music resonate with the non-Jewish world? Yeah, I think more recently, a lot of the new songs, I think from Motherland Bounce was sort of like the beginning of me rolling out a lot of other records that I've been sort of like sitting on or other ones that I created maybe even around the same time that I, I made a conscious decision to, you know, move more sonically, I guess, you know, from a musical standpoint, back into a space that I felt most comfortable in. Like I said, I can adapt and be a chameleon and, and jump into any space, but I think the best thing for me to have the the success in terms of reaching the amount of people that I want to reach that I have to do something that I'm very, very comfortable and at home in. So I think sonically, 
because the the messages are now in a language that you know people can understand even if they're not Jewish you understand what I'm saying so I think that because of that it's definitely brought in a you know new influx of audience that is not Jewish or could be Jewish and not affiliated at all and this has been a wonderful experience because I feel like at right now more than ever I'm, I'm fulfilling my purpose you know I definitely can't say that I didn't feel like it before but it's like you know, it goes up levels and levels. You know what I mean? It's like this was a place that I knew I was supposed to be. I didn't know how it was going to happen. I was even scared of it happening. But I'm here now and, and, and ready to continue growing. Fantastic. What I was going to add was that you know the the B'nai Noach movement is is growing. We don't we don't proselytize, but the fact that you're taking the message of there being one God who's who is one, and communicating it through that medium where you can reach everyone, I think is is fantastic. You know, it's a very interesting thing on that because the, I, I tell you one day, you know, a lot of these, uh, these crazy stories, I don't tell everybody, but you know, the more and more I'm starting to speak about them because I think it's a major um, lacking of faith in Amuna and God and, and the way that he operates in this generation because of the way that the world's gone that we forget that, you know, God is a, a machadish. He can, he can do whatever he wants at any time and he can create new things all the time. I was once praying to God by the grave of the Lubavitcher Rebbe in New York. And one of the things I was oh, I was praying about to, to Hashem, I was asking him, I said, you know what, you know, the, this rabbi and that rabbi that I'm going to talk to, everybody's pushing me and telling me, you know what, you need to go out. You need to take your message out to the world and reach to the ends of the earth. Quit worrying about the Jewish religious community. Go out, go out, go out and bring people from the, you know. And so I was really struggling with that because although it was a comfortable space for me musically and technically spiritually I was afraid of it and I didn't know you know really is this God but is this really what you want from me and so one of the times that I really struggled with it I was at the grave of the Lubavitcher Rebbe and it happened to be that after I was crying my eyes out, so scared, so afraid, because I didn't want to be a pro, I didn't want to come out for like I'm proselytizing or any of these things. I went in and I sat down. And usually when I'm there, I never sit down in the in the lobby. Thank God that a lot of people know me. So sometimes when I go out to the lobby, you know, a lot of pictures and then snaps. So I really try to be as private and in and out as much as possible. But I was so exhausted from praying so hard. I went out and I sat down and I seen this uh, this this video of the Lubavitcher Rebbe. And he was speaking at that time how important it was to actively go out and spread Hashem's name and to create B'nai Noach. That everybody should know that, that Hashem is in the world and how important during this generation, you know, when everybody's not trying to kill us and everybody's not your name we can have a power of influence how dare we not spread god's name and i promise you what's happening right there in front of my eyes that i was like god's like you know <laughs> using this video to, to to speak to me so with that i also thought of it like this we are called to be a priestly nation and to be a or lagoyim a light to the nations here's the thing if Hashem didn't care about the nations, then why would he need a light for them? It's because God really wants the nations. He wants that light to be spread to them. So therefore, he needs to leave a light on for them. So once I understood that, uh, you know, uh, I've been running and I, and I haven't stopped. Absolutely. Right? When I discovered your music four months ago and started listening to it, I started telling everyone in this community about it. And they're like, yeah, we know, Dan. We all know. We, like they, they all, you're, like everyone here is a fan of yours. I think what you're doing is amazing. I wanted to thank you on behalf of all Clay SRL for joining us. Bring your music with you to the Jewish community and everything you do. You've been a great inspiration to all of us. I want to let you know if you ever find yourself in Houston, Texas, I can speak on behalf of this community. You're always welcome here. We'll always make accommodations. I will tell you that the shul I go to, who is so passionate with their singing, they would, uh, you would feel right at home. And I would like to ask you if you could give a blessing to the organization that I work with, TORCH, the Tor Outreach Center of Houston. You know, our, our job to the, the, what the rabbis do is, is reaching out to Jews and non-Jews alike and spreading Hashem's Torah to them. And uh, we would uh, really appreciate if you could just give a blessing for their ongoing success. I give you, you guys all a bracha for success, hatzlach, and every single thing that you do. 
You should receive a holy das, holy, 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 holy knowledge and chokhmah, and 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 Hashem should infuse you all with the with the ability and the uh, to be able to reach to the ends of the earth. Beautiful thing said by Rabbi Nachman of Breslov. He says that when one is able to ignite a light in those who are very far, the rechoking from Hashem. This is the greatest honor to God that can possibly that anyone can possibly give. It's a very well known thought and uh, and and. and Hasidic thought also that there's no higher way of coming closer to Hashem than what it takes to bring another year back to Hashem and to be able to spread His name in the places that it was never spread before. So I grant you all blessing that you should receive the highest kept or the highest crown in Shemayim and Hashem should bless you with all the resources that you need, both physically and also spiritually. Bezat Hashem. Thank you so much, Nassim, and may you be continue to receive the blessings of tremendous amount of spiritual growth, success, and influence on the Jewish people for you and your family. I greatly appreciate you taking the time out of your busy schedule uh, to speak with us today. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. It's my honor. My honor. This is my love letter. Thank you. When I'm in need, I look in your direction. I wrote her down so I can let you know. I'm holding on, won't ever let you go. Every nigga try was I'm working. I was down in the dark, then you saw I was hurting, and everything fell apart. Then you pulled me out from here, gave me what to look to, yeah. I ain't never been the same, this is permanent change. They told me I was supposed to fall long ago, but they didn't know about that fire in my soul. God with me, God left me, giving everything I have. Shake the haters in the hate, yeah. Moving on from the bad, moving on from the past. Recognize came, put my heart on the platter, but it can't be contained. All the residue remains, giving glory to his name. Sunshine won't shine, this time make rain. This is my love letter, so for heaven. When I'm in need, I look in your direction. I wrote her down so I can let you know. I'm holding on, won't ever let you go. This is my love letter, so for heaven When I'm in need, I look in your direction I wrote it down so I can let you know yeah, I'm holding yeah. on, I won't ever let you go Yeah, I've been down, been hurt More pain, more work Life ain't what it seems If you don't know the word I was really doing dirt Crying tears, strong fears Looking at my wife and kids, yeah Look at what God did Proud black, proud yeah Ain't ashamed how I live Promised land living, yeah This is really what it is Be me, you be you Just keep it to the truth Let go what they let go Hold on to the you This is my love letter, so for heaven When I'm in need, I look in your direction I wrote her down aye, so I can let aye, you know aye, aye, I'm holding on, won't ever let you go aye, aye, This is my love aye, letter, so aye, for heaven aye, When I'm in need, I look in your direction aye, aye, I wrote her down aye, so I can let you know aye, aye, I'm holding on, won't ever let you go If you enjoyed this episode, please consider supporting Torch so they can continue to spread Torah wisdom to the world by making a donation at torchweb.org and clicking Donate in the top right corner of the page. And if you would like to get in contact with our host with comments, suggestions for future topics of learning, or questions for him or his guest rabbis, you may email him at president at torchweb.org.